Thanks very much, uh, Paul. Um, and I'm, I'm going to start right in uh, while they're getting this uh, set up so that we do have as much time. And, and also because uh, I'm running out of voice here, uh, having come, um, unfortunately, to UCSD uh, with a bit of a cold. Um, and so still trying to uh, recover from that uh, and have enough uh, left to uh, say something about this book. Um, it's a real pleasure to be back at UCSD. Uh, Paul and I have many good years here together uh, from 1990 to my retirement in uh, 2012. Uh, I've been living up at Berkeley since then uh, and finally got a chance to write this book that I've been working on for 30 years. So um, why accidental holy land? Let's see what happens here. Let's try page down. No, nothing's working. Um, all right, I'll let the experts deal with that. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. Um, first, holy land. Um, as most of you know, uh, Yan is the Gaming Shangdi, and it has this enormous uh, museum there uh, to the history of the revolution in uh, Yan. Uh, it was a communist base from 1937 to 1947 through the years of the war of resistance against Japan. Uh, it was a place where the Communist Party army uh, increased from probably 13,000 people total when the Long March ended there uh, in Shanganing uh, in 1935 to probably a million men under arms uh, at the end of the War of Resistance. Um, it was the place where the Communist Party developed into a force that could actually challenge the nationalists to power. It was also the place um, where Mao rose in the party. Um, it was uh, closely associated with the rise of Mao and the domination of the party by Mao. Uh, before 1938, um, Mao's status within the party was always to some degree uh, challenged uh, by uh, other people, whether Zhang Letao uh, or Wang Ming, uh, after he returned uh, at the start of the War of Resistance. Uh, but it's also a place where Mao wrote the writings for which he is so famous uh, on practice, on contradictions, the Yan'an uh, talks on literature and art, uh, his military writings on protracted war, uh, and the brief essays that uh, were memorized by millions of Chinese during uh, the Cultural Revolution, uh, Serve the People, uh, The Foolish Old Man Who Moved the Mountains, uh, Memory of, of Norman Bethune, and so on. And finally, uh, of course, um, it was uh, the place where uh, Xi Jinping's father, Xi Zhongxin uh, rose to his own uh, prominence. Um, there are museums throughout the Shanbei uh, in honor of, of Xi Zhongxin. Uh, I have to say, uh, I think that bus there looks more like his son <laughs> than the father. Um, and I'm not quite sure why that is, but anyway, um, there are uh, busts of him uh, throughout. Um, and uh, if you visit the headquarters of uh, the Northwest Bureau of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, as I believe Xi Jinping did um, during his recent visit uh, with the new Central Committee uh, to Yan, um, uh, that uh, Northwest Bureau now is much more uh, centered around Xi Jinping. Uh, than it is uh, around Gaudang, uh, who was uh, the head of the uh, Northwest Bureau uh, for so long, but uh, is rather difficult to find uh, in the party history uh, of this period. 
the caves, uh, the museums, uh, uh, the busts of uh, Xi Jinping, uh, Xi Jinping, uh, all of this, uh, you know, pretty much uh, speak to the way in which uh, this is the memory uh, that uh, present day China wants to preserve uh, of where the party came from. Uh, as, as Xi Jinping uh, said, uh, when he visited, uh, no matter how far we've come, no matter how bright the future, we cannot forget the past. We cannot forget why we started. Um, and uh, obviously for him, uh, it all started in Yunnan. So um, that's, uh, that's the, the past. Um, and uh, that's uh, Yunnan of the past. And what I'd like to argue here is that uh, if we want to understand where the party came from, uh, we should spend less time in places like Shanghai, uh, where the party was founded, uh, but it doesn't have a hell of a lot to do uh, with the rise of the party, um, and more time in these simple villages of Shanghai uh, with their caves uh, and uh, their peasant economy. So that's Holy Land. Um, but why accidental? The stress on accidental uh, is explicitly uh, distinguish my own scholarship from the view of the Communist Party, which is uh, that this revolution was inevitable uh, and the product of some inevitable Iran uh, process uh, that uh, brought the party to power. Um, but it's also uh, a feature of much of my own philosophy and history. Um, more on that uh, in the Q&A, but I'll, I'll just leave it at that now. Uh, but more importantly, um, Yan is conventionally viewed um, as the end point of the Long March. Um, and I'm sure all of you have seen uh, this map or things like it. I think this one actually come, probably comes from Wikipedia. Um, and, you know, it, it gives this sort of winding, tortuous line of the Long March. Uh, and then it ends in this, uh, you know, glorious place uh, in, in which actually Yan'an is included, which is phony. Uh, the Yan was not part of the base uh, by the time Mao arrived there. Um, and the base was not anywhere near uh, that large. But that wasn't where the Long March was supposed to go. Um, Mao himself wrote. Uh, or spoke in a, a Central Committee meeting in September of 1935. At present, we should engage in guerrilla struggle fighting towards the Soviet border. This is our basic policy at present. In the past, the center opposed this policy. Uh, now things have changed. So we should be clear about this problem. And through guerrilla warfare, fight through to open an international connection and with the direction and help of the international, the communist international, rest and restore our military strength and increase the size of our army. We absolutely reject the idea that it's wrong to seek help from others. We are a branch of the international. Uh, and it goes on. Um, so uh, the Long March, uh, you know, was aiming at a number of different uh, targets, but by the time uh, Mao had met with and broken with Zhang Guotal uh, and gotten up to the Northwest, uh, he wasn't intending to go to uh, Shanbei at all. Um, the objective was to get to the Soviet border. And if one just thinks for a moment about what all the imagery of Yan means, uh, and self-reliance uh, and serving the people uh, and peasant revolution uh, and so on and so forth. Um, what is now often called socialism with Chinese characteristics. Um, all those things that brought 
uh, the waves of youth uh, to uh, Yan uh, to build a new China. Um, that in many ways is an accident of history. Um, and one might think for a moment uh, as a, a sort of uh, intellectual psychological Warshak test, um, what if Mao had reached the Soviet border? Uh, would, wouldn't China now look a lot like North Korea um, and Kim Il-sung? Um, you know, it's a very different model uh, from that which uh, Xi Jinping wants to find in the caves of Yan. But a month after making that statement, uh, Mao learned from a newspaper that there was, to his uh, amazement, a communist base in northern Shanxi. Um, and he redirected his army uh, in that uh, direction. So in effect, Mao ended up in Yan'an by accident. Uh, it was not uh, predetermined in any sense. Uh, it was not the objective of the Long March. Uh, he just happened to learn uh, that there was a base there and he said, uh, let's go. But more than important than that, uh, when Mao got to Shanganing or Shangan region, uh, he's not entering Yan'an uh, yet at the time. Yan'an is still under the Guomindang's uh, command. Um, he was bitterly disappointed. Uh, it was poor. It was backward. It, it was underpopulated. Uh, he did not see it as a possible place to support the army that he wanted to build uh, to uh, govern all of China. Uh, as soon as he got uh, to um, uh, to Shanghai. First, he tried to uh, launch the Eastern expedition into Shanxi, Shanxi um, and he got blocked uh, when Chiang Kai-shek uh, ultimately uh, joined Yan Shishan uh, there. Uh, then he decided he was going to go up uh, through Ningxia um, and try to reach the Soviet border uh, in that direction, uh, he's, he's completely blown out of that. It's, it's only then that he gets to Baoan, which is where Edgar Snow uh, it interviews him uh, late in 1935. Uh, and he tries to get uh, up through Ningxia. Uh, that failed. Um, he hoped that uh, Zhang Guotao would bring his larger army uh, and the two of them together could reach Ningxia. But, uh, Zhang Guotao's army was decimated in Gansu. Um, Mao never wanted to stay in Yan. Uh, it was just too poor a place. And he ended up staying there only because uh, on the uh, eve of his annihilation uh, by Zhang Kai-shek's uh, campaigns, uh, Zhang Xiaoliang launched the Xi'an uh, incident. Uh, John was uh, kidnapped, arrested, uh, held um, under uh, duress, um, and uh, the Communist Party was saved. Uh, Mao suggested another number of other alternative places he might be sent to. Uh, he wanted to go to the front against Japan. He wanted to go to Shanan, uh, which was much richer. Uh, and basically, Jiang Kai-shek said, no, you, you stay at Shanan. Um, so he stays there um, uh, despite uh, that. So once again, uh, Mao never wanted to be in Shanan. Uh, he had no... And finally, when Mao finally leaves in uh, the spring of 1978, he never went back. There was no sympathetic tie to Yan uh, in Mao's career. Um, and uh, that whole fiction of the Yan spirit and so on uh, is a fiction of later communist historiography. So how was that base built that Mao 
discovered uh, through the newspaper article uh, in the fall of uh, 1935. Uh, that's essentially the story that I have tried to uh, uncover uh, in this book. Uh, I'm a social historian. Um, that's the way I try to go about uh, my work. Um, and so beyond the uh, accidental Holy Land side of things, uh, really the bulk of the book uh, is about this early history uh, and the building of the revolutionary base. Um, now, Northern Shanxi is notoriously poor. Uh, this area up here, Shanghai, uh, as is known in China. Um, and that's what was part of the sort of whole appeal of the Yan'an spirit. Um, it became uh, the place that our urban workers uh, went uh, in patriotic uh, commitment uh, to the revolutionary transformation the building of a new China uh, during the war against Japan. Uh, men and women as all, well. Uh, I rather like this uh, picture of these are, you know, uh, classic uh, wartime short-haired uh, women uh, in all kinds of shoes and, and uh, uh, brown bronzed faces and so on. Um, these are the young people uh, who went to, to Yan uh, during the war. Um, all of the communist bases were, of course, in sparsely populated, hilly regions. Uh, Yan was not, uh, and Shanbei was not unique in that. Um, but Shanbei was not uniformly poor. Um, and this is one of the things that I uh, have tried to uh, spend a lot of time on uh, in the book. This area along the Mudin He River here, uh, from Yulian to Niger is here, Sreda, um, is a relatively wealthy, uh, rich, uh, well-developed. Um, and uh, it stands in quite a, a contrast to the area um, on uh, the Shagan side on, on the west. Um, which is these barren hills. You can hardly even see a village uh, in this area. Um, landlords often lived in these kind of fortress, uh, hilltop fortresses uh, in the area. Um, and uh, the schools, uh, it, indeed the school that the leader of the revolution in here, Liu Zhidan, uh, went uh, to, uh, you know, were these kind of tiny one-room schoolhouses. Uh, the villages were small, the towns were small, the schools were small. The elite in this area was a military elite. Uh, there are very few schools uh, to begin with at all. They didn't have uh, degrees in the old examination system, um, but uh, they uh, had, uh, there were lots of bandits. Uh, there were lots of secret societies, mostly the Gulahui is the, is the key secret society. Um, <laughs> and that's the kind of uh, place that, that Shanbei was. So um, you have these two areas of uh, northern Shanxi, uh, the west, which is poor, uh, less, much more sparsely populated. Uh, and you have the East, uh, which is richer uh, and has a gentry elite. Um, this is a school. Now, it wasn't quite that large uh, in the Republican era, uh, but this is a school in the East. Uh, and you contrast that to the previous one. So I'm going to, um, actually, I don't even know if this is going to show. Um, in fact, let's, let's forget this whole uh, section. This, this is um, a place where we happen to stay uh, during my first uh, visit to Shanbei. Um, it's uh, well-preserved because Mao stayed there. Um, and uh, Mao stayed in these two caves. 
uh, we stayed in, in, in the one next to it, which was his, his Gene Wake uh, uh, cave. Uh, extremely comfortable. This is a, a you know, Mao only always got the best caves, uh, and this one really, really but um, and uh, oh, sorry, I right, was going to show something. Uh, I'm going to let, let this pan for a while, uh, partly because it's going to give you a sense of uh, the much uh, more densely populated uh, and richer villages uh, of this eastern. Uh, part uh, of the problem. This is now looking out um, for this, the, the, the um, courtyard that we just looked at is this courtyard here, the one that used to have the snow. Um, that, that now you can see it uh, there. Um, and we're going to get to a market scene in a moment, right. which will give you a sense. Uh, uh, this also is, is a former uh, big landlord village. Um, uh, 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 and so you get a sense of the, uh, the gentry elite uh, of this area, as opposed to the kind of militia bandit elite uh, that uh, existed in uh, the West. Um, what year was this, Joe? What year was this? Yeah. The Jiang Jiang, oh, when is it? 89. 89. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this is a market scene. I mean, you just, the, the village in, in which Liu Zhidan grew up, which is actually called a Jin, Jin Tan Zheng, had four households. Um, I mean, that's the size of a Jin uh, in, uh, in the Western section. Um, and look at this. Uh, this is what it's like in these. This area, by the way, only came under communist control uh, in 1940 when Wang Jun came over there. Uh, it's only at that point that uh, the communists were able to rule an area uh, that uh, is, is, this guy here uh, is a much longer, much younger uh, Joe Eshrick uh, wandering around the cloud. Uh, there, uh, you know, there's uh, uh, more brown hair, and uh, uh, so anyway, uh, let's see if we can just get it. Okay, um, so um, the that's what we just saw was this area over here, uh, the bandit uh, militia area is uh, over in the west. Um, how did this happen? Um, and I think I've gotten totally ahead of my slides here. So um, how did this happen? It really only happened as a result of the Muslim rebellions of the 1870s. Um, if you look at a population map, uh, and I tried to calculate from the best mid late Qing, uh, mid 19th century uh, census around the 1850s uh, to the census in, in the 1930s. Um, and this light color is less than half uh, the mid 19th century population. And this whole area down here uh, is essentially depopulated as a result of the Muslim rebellion. Uh, I tried for so long to try and figure out why it was that Shangan was so much poorer and so uh, much more lightly populated than uh, the Northeast. Uh, and really that's uh, the only uh, answer. Um, and that too is only because the Muslims who originally were here uh, were all driven into Gansu. Uh, and then they tried to go down the Luo River to get to their homeland. Um, and they followed right down that. And, and of course were decimated along the way uh, and they killed and the others killed uh, and the whole population suffered uh, as a result. So that's the, now, uh, let's talk about the revolution itself and the revolutionary heroes. 
Uh, the hero, of course, is Dujana. Uh, he is the hero of the Shanbei Revolution. You can still see, uh, uh, you know, a, a great billboards uh, of the Dujana. So I got to get you going, Junior. Yeah, but you see, of the Northern. He was a man of the Northwest. Um, and the county that he came from, Bawan, now renamed uh, Duran. Uh, and he, as I said, you know, he came from a town that had only four households in it. Uh, he was a military man, went to school in the east where the, where the uh, schools were, uh, and then uh, went to a military career, uh, being sent to the Wangpo Academy, uh, then joined the Communist Party uh, and uh, followed on uh, from there. He makes a number of attempted revolutionary uh, coups uh, in 1928 after the break with the Guamadang. Uh, they all fail. Uh, he joins local warlord armies, uh, sort of on the on the Jula model, um, and tries to turn them over. Uh, all of them uh, fail, um, and then uh, finally he begins slowly to uh, build uh, a little um, a movie that this is his home. Um, uh, begin to build uh, a little movement. Uh, along the Shanghai border here. At that point, when he finally gets to things together, so that he has an army of maybe between three and 500 men or something like that, uh, the provincial committee begins to pay attention to it. And so the provincial committee sends uh, their uh, chairman uh, as the political commissar for uh, Liu Zhidan's army. Um, and the political commissar, in his wisdom, decides that uh, this is a lousy place to make revolution. Uh, you want to go south of the Wei River uh, into the Weinan area, where uh, there was uh, more of what was an early base of the Communist Party. Uh, there were some schools there and, and communists in the schools. Um, and of course, it was much closer to Xi'an and the possible proletariat and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> uh, Liu Zhidan, who always followed orders, uh, went south and his army was decimated, uh, completely wiped out. Um, and he goes back uh, to the north and then uh, slowly starts uh, building his army uh, again. But he only has real success in 1933, uh, 34, 35. Um, and the reason for that, I think, is uh, both critical uh, and interesting. Uh, first, the provincial committee was busted uh, in 1933, in the summer of 1933. Uh, so Liu Zhidan essentially no longer has uh, stupid superiors telling him to fight in places where his army is going to get him. He's on his own, um, and he's able to uh, negotiate uh, his own revolutionary strategy. The other thing that happens um, is that the Shanbei party had always been pretty much divided between a what were called a Shangan uh, group, which was Liu Zhidan, uh, Gao Gang, uh, Xi Zhongxin, uh, that group, um, and the Shanbei uh, group, uh, which was under a man called Xie Zichang, um, which is from Anding Xian uh, here. Uh, so this area uh, up that I mentioned as the 
the site of significant gentry power was never any place that the communists could ever really establish a base. Um, they had a few teachers in the schools and so on and so forth, uh, but it was only further south uh, here in this area uh, that there still was a, a school system, uh, but there wasn't the strong gentry power. The Guamandang, even during the wartime period, uh, continued to dominate Yudin. Um, and, and that's where their military power, uh, GSU, uh, was the local uh, military uh, leader. In the summer of uh, 1935, Liu has a series of dramatic successes, uh, which are the successes which caused the newspaper article that Mao Zedong read uh, in Gansu uh, in the fall. Um, and the basic story there is that late in 34, the leader of the Shanbei Bang, Xie Zishang, was wounded in battle and he dies in early 35. Liu Zhidan, at that point, is able to move his military forces uh, from the west into this eastern section. The eastern section had a weak military, but it had a strong party base in the schools, in the villages. Um, and only at that point was the party able to combine the strength of the party in the villages uh, with the strength uh, of the uh, of uh, Liu's uh, military force. Uh, the party villages, uh, again, uh, it's important to note, um, were basically uh, talked of at the time as uh, Shirtsun, uh or Holtzun uh, and Baitsun. Uh, they divided by village. Um, the, the whole village got together. It was very difficult to divide a village against itself. Uh, we don't have class warfare uh, in this period. Uh, you have a communist dominated village uh, and then you have a Guomindang uh, uh, dominated uh, village. And in the summer of uh, 1935, Liu Jinan succeeds in taking uh, Yen Chang with his Ansai, Bao An, Jin Bian, Ding Bian. These, the first time that his forces had ever been able to take a county capital at all, um, he never had anything like that success. Even to, to take a small militia uh, base uh, was beyond the capabilities. But <clears throat> once he was able to combine his military forces with the political base of the party in the schools, uh, he then had a military force that could uh, achieve some success in Shanghai. <clears throat> that brings Yan Shan in. Yan uh gets beaten a, a couple of times. He goes back. He gives a speech about the communists are in control of all of Shanbei. Uh, we've got to do something about this. And that's the report that Mao reads uh, in uh, Gansu. Um, and as a result of that, um, uh, the uh, party uh, moves itself uh, towards uh, towards Yan. Yeah. May I just interrupt one second? Yeah. The Zoom audiences aren't able to see the slides, unfortunately. I think there's a problem with sharing of the screen. I'm just going to okay. do it over yeah. again. Sorry right. for the interruption. Um, wow, well, we're working out that problem. Um, as is so typical, no? in the history of the Communist Party. Uh, success is only rewarded with courage 
and disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, and what happens as a result of Liu Jidan's success in 1935 uh, is that the Shanbei faction is now strengthened by the arrival of Xu Haidong from the Oyuan uh, Soviet uh, under uh, Xu Haidong. Uh, it's, that's, that is the former Zhang Tao Soviet, uh, rather more proper leftist um, and uh, much better at purging one's enemies. Um, and so Xu Haidong and the Shanbei faction begin to launch a Zuban against Liu Junan. And it's at that point that Liu Junan, Gao Gang, Xi Zhongxin, uh, and you know, about 100 others are all arrested and put under guard, uh, imprisoned in Waiapu, uh, and uh, held there. Uh, Mao arrives uh, just at the nick of time. Uh, and uh, according to, let's see, I don't want to make that. All right. It's okay if we just go quickly through these, yeah, uh, get us back to uh, where we should be. Um, uh, according to the Orthodox history, uh, uh, Mao says, uh, what, what is it? Uh, 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 Tingers about uh, uh, anyway. Uh, stop the killing. Uh, stop the arrest. Um, and I look for any contemporary document that has Mao saying any such thing. In fact, the only the, the, the most authoritative place that I've seen that uh, is in Jin Zhong Ji's uh, biography of Mao. Uh, and I asked uh, Jin Junji about that, and I said, you know, where, what's the, what's the source for that? Because I haven't been able to find it anywhere. Uh, and he had to admit that, well, uh, it, it's so commonly known that I had to put it in there. So it's one of the few places where an authoritative history uh, actually seems to have fabricated something uh, instead of just uh, left it out or glossed it over. Uh, in some way or another. Um, the purge was stopped, uh, probably by Zhou Enlai, uh, not, not by Mao himself. Mao meets with Xu Haidong and meets with the guys who put them under arrest and does nothing about it. Um, but in the end, uh, Liu is uh, released. Uh, but uh, then his army is put under the command of Xu Aidong, the guy who had arrested him. Um, and uh, Liu himself is given an army uh, uh, made up of former guerrillas, uh, a very weak and ill-trained army. Uh, he's sent into uh, Shanxi uh, in the Dongzhong um, and is killed in battle. Um, if you ask anyone in Shanbei, uh, they'll tell you that Mao had him killed or the party had him killed. Um, that's needless to say, not the official history um, and probably uh, even, even in Shanbei, they're probably not saying it anymore now um, because that's no longer proper. Um, now, what are the lessons uh, of all of this, there we are. Um, <coughs> first of all, <clears throat> there was nothing inevitable uh, about the victory uh, of the party. Uh, its success was the result of a series of accidents, um, but I would stress that even accidents have causes. Um, to say it's accidental is not to say that it was random uh, or not to say that it, it uh, you know, had no reason or, uh, at all. It's just that you need to look for uh, the small details of uh, local history uh, in order to get at 
uh, of the causes. Uh, and those small details are what shape the course uh, of history, uh, not the grand uh, trends that we're so easily uh, enamored by. Second, the revolution was a very violent struggle. Um, and violence was an integral part uh, of the revolutionary process. Uh, I've stressed mostly the military conflict here because that's the most obvious, um, but uh, it was much more uh, than just the military struggle. Um, the nationalists were always uh, better armed, uh, usually more numerous. Um, it was organization, intelligence, the ability to hide among the population uh, that probably were the key. I would stress that I wouldn't say popular support was important. Uh, there's no real evidence of popular support here. Uh, what a revolution took was the support of a certain portion of the population and the intimidation or the passivity or the staying out of the way of the rest of the population. Uh, neutrality by the majority was probably sufficient uh, in most cases. And terror was important. Uh, red terror was absolutely uh, supported. Uh, young recruits were even attested uh, by their willingness to go and kill somebody with their own hands uh, as a, a way of proving their uh, real loyalty uh, to the revolution. Third, um, organization is not a sufficient explanation. Uh, superior uh, party organization uh, was clearly a factor. Uh, the nationalists were also a Leninist party, but a really poorly organized and ill-disciplined uh, Leninist uh, party. Um, the, they themselves recognized that the communists were much better organized and much more disciplined uh, than uh, the Guomindang was. But disciplined organization can also uh, produce bloody purges and it can produce sending an army like New uh into areas where it's going to get wiped out. Uh, if you have a party that uh, is just going to follow orders, uh, those orders, if they're not incorrect, uh, can lead you to a disaster. Um, and um, after 1949, uh, we can think of any number of cases. The Great Leap Forward is, I think, the most obvious uh, in which the strength of the party organization led to an unmitigated disaster. Um, and uh, time will only tell uh, whether the strength of Xi Jinping's uh, organization today uh, is going to lead to great success uh, or great disaster. Finally, the victory uh, of uh, the Communist Party uh, remains, I would argue, a vital topic for historical analysis. Uh, we tried the grand theories, Mao Zedong and peasant revolution, uh, nationalism and the Japanese invasion, peasant nationalism, the war against Japan and the role of the United Front, uh, the intellectual iconoclasm of the May 4th era uh, and its role in destroying the Confucian uh, ethic that ruled China for so many generations. We've tried all of those things. Uh, all of them were contributors to the process. Uh, I'm sure that all of us have given lectures and would still continue to give lectures in which we would mention those, peasant revolution, Mao, and the peasant movement <laughs> in, in, in Hunan, um, the May 4th movement and intellectual iconoclasm. But I seriously doubt 
whether those are going to be adequate to actually explain the victory of the Communist Party. Um, and I would only appeal uh, to the sense that uh, we need continued local history, not just in places like Shanbei, uh, but throughout China, because I don't uh, expect that this model will work elsewhere. Uh, there's not such a clear uh, military and civilian uh, military and school-based party uh, division in other parts of China. Um, but uh, that whole process, how it worked in each locality, uh, in each area, uh, that the communists gained uh, dominance uh, is a story that still needs to be told and it can't be told simply. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so questions, comments. Uh, we're going to try to get as many in as we can, and I've already told our history PhD students they're going to get the go-ahead. Uh, they have they've read the book, and uh, I'm curious to see what their questions are. But please keep your questions relatively brief, so we can get as many questions in as possible. So who's going to start us off? Yes. Um, hello, uh, uh, I'm not a student major in history, but uh, since I'm Chinese, so I'm very curious about uh, my own history. Um, so first question, uh, I have two questions. The first question I want to ask is, um, we can see a clear difference between um, the historical period before um, 19, um, 1942, the Yan'an uh, the street on the on the literature and, and art. And, yeah, by multi uh, We can see a clear difference uh, before that and after that. Um, before that is rather liberal to the intellectuals. After that is uh, more harder policy. And that's and, and I think that is the point uh, where Mao arrived to power. Uh, so do you think it's an inevitable um, uh, inevitable instance that um, that uh, 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 the Communist Party turned to harsher and more totalitarian uh, policies because of Mao, or is the innate nature of the Communist Party uh, that's, um, that's the... Okay, let, 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 let me ask you, to just let, let's just stick to one question, and, and then uh, if I get a chance to come back to you, uh, I'll do it. Um, uh, one, uh, I didn't deal with Zhang Feng, uh, in this, like my story that uh, ended in essentially 1940. Um, and I didn't talk about it here, um, partly because the documents of that period are not open yet. Um, and we just, uh, you know, I wanted to try and write about things that I really was clear about. Um, my impression, frankly, is that. Um, Mao needed to unify the party in part because he was fighting a guerrilla struggle against Japan and expected to be able to fight a guerrilla struggle against the Guomindang. Uh, and in that kind of struggle, it was necessary to have a loyal party that would carry out appropriate policies on their own initiative in the various bases around China. Uh, and the best way to do that was to have a party that was loyal on principles, but not requiring uh, direct orders to do this or that. Um, so I think that that's the process that's going on there. I think that Zheng Feng started a process, but Mao, in a sense, got carried away. Um, and as he gained more confidence, and the people around him uh, began acceding to his wishes, uh, China went from bad to worse. Um, I don't see anything inevitable about that process, uh, though I don't do party history of that period. Uh, you know, a lot of people here know a lot about more about that, but that would be my head. Uh, it just got worse after uh, 1949. Uh, and then, of course, especially worse after 1956. Okay. Yes, please. Nice and loud. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Professor, for the Wentworth talk. 
uh, while reading your book, it also occurs to me that, so I also think about like for this huge army, red army, how would their clothes, how would their shoes come from? And I, I, I'm not sure because because maybe they could rely on the, the, the local like women who are making all of these clothes and shoes. Uh, I'm not sure if there is any like economic sanctions going on because the, purely the 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 bombing down is pretty was pretty sure that the communist party is there. Um, so to frame my question like a slightly broader, I think you made a very compelling case that um, these contingencies matter. But at, at the same time, I think this contingency is said to largely come from the decision making of these very prominent figures. And most of them are. Um, so so I wonder how was how would your story be a slightly different had it also incorporated perspective of other larger groups like farmers, soldiers, like how they struggled over this time period, and maybe also other social groups like women. Mm -hmm. Um, great question, uh, complicated question. Um, if I try to give you a simplistic answer, uh, it would be that um, the communists did a couple things after they gained control of this area. Um, one of the things they had to do was to eliminate all opposition. And uh, so the first thing they did is anyone who looks like an opponent is called a two thing. Uh, it's called a bandit. Uh, and so they uh, did a massive bandit elimination, who were mostly former landlords and, and uh, uh, local militia leaders. The second thing they did was sort of the more enlightened side of the Communist Party. Uh, they held revolution, uh, held held elections. Um, now, the elections were for a specific purpose. They wanted to be able to claim that their little regional Soviet on the Shangan and Bianchi was a democratic base. And so it had to have something that looked like an election. Um, they made very clear that these elections were being very carefully organized. And they went around and organized in each area and village and so on. When the local cadres assured them that this village is going to nominate all electoral communists, then they had the election. Um, so they made very clear that the elections are supposed to produce a communist government. Uh, but the elections allowed them to keep John Kaishek out because this is allegedly part of bigger China and he should be appointing the magistrates and so on. So they constructed this kind of democratic base or democratic fiction for their regime. Um, finally, uh, mostly Chen Yu, uh, when he returns from the Soviet Union, is put in charge of organization. And he establishes a really quite effective organization section um, in which you have party schools in Yan'an and in the, the counties uh, in which local cadres are trained. And if they're well enough trained, uh, then they're sent into Yan'an uh, for Fai uh, uh, Xiuyang. <clears throat> so, um, he builds a disciplined party organization can reach down into the villages. <clears throat> Once you've got that party organization, you can get the women to make the shoes and make the, uh, Yan is not an area that grows cotton. Um, this cotton has to come in from outside and you've got to spin the, spin the cloth or so on. Um, you look at the women uh, the shoes and the clothes that they're wearing there, um, these are locally made. Um, it, it's tubu. Um, but th they're able to do that um, because the party is able to control uh, and mobilize the women uh, to do that. Uh, they, uh, in, in, in 1947, 
when the Guamanang comes back in, uh, you know, I've seen party documents that, you know, women in this er in this county were responsible for 10,000 uh, sandals for the People's Liberation Army. Uh, you know, they uh, uh, turned them out in, in droves. So, but that's party organization and it takes some time to build. Yeah, a few more minutes. Thank you. Yeah. So if they're not growing cotton and they have to import the cotton, they've got to sell something and mention it in the beginning of the book, but you don't really address it directly in the body of the book, where do you come down on the opium or the, the special goods question, the opium? How, just how important was it? Um, I, I frankly, I don't know how important it is. Uh, I, I, I could not quantify it. A um, couple aspects to this answer. Um, when I was doing my field research in Sean Bay, um, and I'd already gained access to the provincial archives, uh, but I had to get a document from the provincial party secretary uh, down to the local counties. Uh, and there were three items in that document. Uh, Joe Shire is not allowed to see anything that is uh, hui, uh, uh, gaoji hui. Uh, so no high party meetings. Two, no personal records, no individual records. And three, no opium. Um, so um, I uh, had to negotiate on the opium thing because I said, I've read too many documents about uh, the peasants being unhappy about the warlord's opium tax. Um, so uh, I want to ask about opium, but I'm not asking about the communists growing opium. Um, and I, so they said, okay, that's all right. Uh, you know, Guamandang opium, that's all right. <laughs> um, in one village, I asked this question um, and uh, one of the peasants said, oh, no, neither not one, the nigga, you not can, uh, both you not can. Uh, uh, you know, where Wang Jung was there in, in 91, uh, you know, the whole valley was full of opium. Uh, you know, the, the peasant, the, the cadre who had to be sitting behind me was, I, you know, could tell me frantically, stop, stop, you know, no, no, no notes, you know, that, don't they? Um, but, you know, this is a you know, um, so uh, it was absolutely an open secret. Uh, everybody knew uh, that, and it wasn't, uh, individual families, if, if they had to smoke a little themselves, uh, you know, that was allowed. You could have a few things, but the large scale cultivation of opium for export, that was done by the army. Uh, and it was done by the army uh, under army control. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, other than the fact that the 91 was Yapian, uh, uh, but how much that was, I, mean, I, I, I don't know. Um, Let's yeah. give our online people a chance. We've got just a couple of more minutes. Okay. Anything uh, good over there? Yeah, there's one question from Catherine uh, saying, I'm interested in how and to what extent the CCP leadership in Yan'an or the Shanbei area was able to gradually exert more control or guidance over other wartime bases, such as uh, Taihang and uh, Ji, Ji Yu base. Um, in other words, how local or how centralized were the trains, uh, trends in the different wartime base areas? Um, I, uh, I mean, it's, it's a great question. Um, I wish I knew the precise answer. Uh, again, this is an area uh, that's beyond uh, what I've looked at uh, specifically, but my clear impression is <coughs> all those other base areas, uh, you know, uh, you know, that was created by Deng Xiaoping and, and others um, that were sent there with uh, a uh, 
number of Balochin uh, and, and others um, to establish a base. Um, as I said before, in, in reaction to another, my impression of this whole period is that Mao knew that uh, this was going to be a local guerrilla struggle in every area, and you had to allow some initiative to the local leaders to carry out the revolution in their way. Um, and he wasn't going to uh, second guess them on the details. Um, that what was necessary was to get them to understand and to uh, support the general principles of party rule and national revolution and so on and so forth. And once he did that, then, you know, as long as you're winning, I I'm not going to raise any questions. If, <laughs> if things screw up, um, you know, th then you're going to have to pay for it. Um, but uh, so, I mean, that, that, that's the way I would see, you know, Shandong was a problematic base all the time. Um, and Mao had a lot more uh, doubts about that one uh, than he did about Tiji Mui. Okay, one more, and this will have to be it because we've already run over. Yes, sir. Uh, oh. A student or faculty? Which one? Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> one faculty question. One faculty question, okay, Victor. Oh, yeah, very quickly. Um, so, do you think the arrival of the long marchers, uh, besides kind of giving more numbers to the communists, was also kind of a human capital organizational skill? Uh, shock to the system that really allowed the Shanbei communists to organize better. I mean, you kind of hinted at that with the shoes common, um, uh, but kind of the shaping of the local communists was was kind of limited. And the long marchers, at least the ones who survived, you know, they were central committee members, very well educated, Soviet educated, steeped in uh, organizational principles of the party. Uh, do you think that benefited the development of the base area greatly, or do you think that it was really just a numbers game? You know, just by having more communists, it allowed the base area to thrive. I think it's much more than a numbers game. Uh, I, I think it raised the quality. Uh, I think there's no question about that. Um, but it also makes Shande the center of the revolution. Um, and so in that sense, Shanbei benefited as well, but also uh, had to pay a price in that it makes Jiang Kai-shek all the more anxious to try and eliminate them. Um, I, don't, uh, I don't buy this uh, line that the Xi'an incident made no difference. Um, that um, uh, you know, uh, they would have grown anyway, uh, or Jiang uh, Kai-shek uh, would have made a deal with them anyway. He was already negotiating with them. Uh, yes, he was negotiating with them, but the, the negotiations were going nowhere, and, and Jiang Kai-shek was just as good as as Mao at Da Da Jiang Jiang, Da Da Tang Tang. Uh, you know, uh, he, he was quite willing to negotiate and fight. Um, and he had uh, the communists uh, trapped uh, there in, in the Northwest. Um, uh, th there really wasn't much more left but Baan and a little bit of the neighboring things. Um, if if uh, uh, that had gone through, uh, you know, it, it come to light at one, one final battle, um, he, he, he may have succeeded. Um, so um, I, I think, you know, they add uh, a level of expertise and, and uh, uh, seniority um, and Neo uh, Jadon and the others are, are not prepared to challenge them at all. Um, even Galdon, you know, was not. Um, on the other hand, I mean, let me say, um, there was some recognition that they needed the local people. 
when when there the, the one election that really mattered uh, in Shanghai uh, is there's an election to the Shandong Bianshu Dangwei. Gao Gong stood for that, uh, but he wasn't on the nominees list that the center had given. He nonetheless got the most votes. Um, the local party members essentially voted him in. Um, and he ended up with more votes than even the Mao. Um, so um, the, the local party did get sort of one little victory there. Uh, they got one, you know, the, the closest thing to a representative in Galgan. Uh, now, of course, Galgan decides that, you know, he, he better go with Mao uh, and, and become Mao's toady. But, um, they, you know, they, they represented something. They had something. Okay, a couple of concluding comments. One, I want to draw your attention to the wonderful events that are coming up in the future. Please read that before you leave. And secondly, thank you very much, Joe, for coming and giving us a